In our previous video, we talked a lot about lung pathology, and lung pathology can damage your lungs. And a side effect to lung damage is something called pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension is hypertension of your pulmonary vasculature. So let's just draw this out. You have your right heart, your right heart, and that pumps deoxygenated blood via your pulmonary artery to your lungs. And your pulmonary arteries will branch out and eventually become capillaries and that goes to your alveoli and gets goes through gas exchange. Hopefully nothing new there. All right. And after it gets oxygenated, it goes via your pulmonary vein into your left heart. Your left heart. Your left heart will pump that now oxygenated blood out to your body and that return and the cycle repeats itself. And so Pulmonary hypertension is hypertension of the vasculature of your lungs. So your pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, your capillaries, your capillaries. And pulmonary hypertension is no different than regular hypertension. Or no different than regular type hypertension. And all the factors that come into play to regular hypertension are the same factors that come into play in pulmonary hypertension. Some factors include preload, preload or basically the volume in your vessels. You have more volume in your vessels, you have more pressure. Yeah, and in regular hypertension, we talked about increased preload, increased volume, causing that hypertension. Well, here we can have increased volume, yeah. If you have left heart failure, if you have left heart failure, this pump breaks, then all the blood will back up into your lungs. You get increased volume, increased preload, you get pulmonary hypertension. Another factor, a very big factor, probably the biggest factor is radius, or the size of your lumen. Yeah, if you have a very narrow lumen, then you're gonna have a lot of pressure. It's gonna take a lot of pressure to get through that narrow lumen. Causes pulmonary hypertension, causes regular hypertension. So radius is actually the biggest factor. If you remember our, our equations from our cardio block, then you know radius was to the fourth power. All right, so changes here are multiplied to the fourth power. In regular hypertension, we said you have things like atherosclerosis that can cause the narrowing of the lumen. Well, how about pulmonary hypertension? What causes the narrowing of that lumen? A lot of the lung pathology that we previously talked about can cause fibrosis. Fibrosis. Doesn't fibrosis narrow the lumen? So you get a narrow lumen. So that narrows the lumen, causes hypertension. And whenever you have hypertension, that pounding, pounding pressure against your endothelium, then you can damage your endothelium and cause more atherosclerosis, or in, our, or in our case, arteriosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis, and that further narrows the lumen, arteriosclerosis. And you can actually see this on biopsy. If you cut the lungs in half, you can actually see this on biopsy. You can see capillaries that have fibrosis, that are getting narrowed. We call this plexiform lesions. Plexiform lesions. Okay. Also in lung damage, also in lung damage, if you damage your alveoli, it can no longer take part in gas exchange, it, you get hypoxia. What happens to your lung in hypoxia? Don't you have hypoxic vasoconstriction? Hypoxic vasoconstriction. Just another way we narrow the lumen, just another way we can cause pulmonary hypertension. Okay, just another way we can cause pulmonary hypertension. Now regular hypertension, you can just measure uh, your blood pressure with a blood pressure cuff. Well, we can't really use a blood pressure cuff to measure our lungs, so we do a catheter instead. Yeah, we put a catheter into your pulmonary artery and we measure the pressure there. And normally your pulmonary artery pressure is usually less than 25. So if it's more than 25, you know, okay, there's hypertension. There is hypertension. Okay. Now your right heart has to pump against these narrow vessels that may be full of fluid and it really has to strain. And so a side effect of pulmonary hypertension is gonna be right ventricular hypertrophy. Eventually it'll work and work and work until it can't work anymore, you get right heart failure. What do we call right heart failure due to pulmonary causes? We call it core pulmonary, remember? Hopefully you do. Now this is a lot of cardio for a respiratory talk, but we're gonna do a little bit more cardio. Can you pause the video and list all the signs of right heart failure. Pause the video, list the signs. Give you a second to do that. If you said things like uh, pitting edema in your legs, if you said things like hepatomegaly, the whole nutmegaly, everything, then you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So that's pulmonary hypertension in a nutshell. Well, what causes pulmonary hypertension? We said lung causes. It was a big one. Lung causes. Especially in the developed world. In the developing world, you have something called cysto 
mass. This is a, basically a worm that can go into your lungs, damage your lungs, cause fibrosis, cause that narrowing, causing that hypertension. Causing that hypertension. We said you can have things like left heart failure. When you have left heart failure, fluid builds up. Makes basically more volume, more congestion, more edema, hypertension. You have chronic emboli. So if you have recurrent emboli, that just damages your lung a ton. Damages your lung, causing fibrosis, causing arteriosclerosis, causing hypertension. So pulmonary or chronic recurrent emboli is a big one. You can have chronic hypoxia. Now a lot of lung diseases can cause chronic hypoxia like um, COPD, but you can have non-lung diseases. You might be living in a high altitude. You might be living in the Alps. Aren't these people always kind of chronically hypoxic? You can have things like sleep apnea. All right. Anytime you have chronic hypoxia, for whatever reason, they want you to know that your body releases EPO. All right. That's the hormone that increases red blood cells. To carry what little oxygen you have to your tissue. They like to ask that a lot, so increase EPO. I just want to talk, touch on sleep apnea for a second here. Sleep apnea, judging by the name, is when you have times where you stop breathing, that's the apnea part, in your sleep. Times you stop breathing in your sleep. One causes obstructive sleep apnea, and one causes is central sleep apnea. So the first cause of obstructive sleep apnea, judging by the name, there's some sort of obstruction in your airway. Commonly seen, it's actually the most common cause of sleep apnea, commonly seen in very overweight patients or people that have really thick necks, really fat, a lot of fat around their, their head and neck area. So all right, obese. And when they lay down, then their airway can get floppy, especially at night when your muscles kind of relax. So they can lay down, they get a floppy airway, their airway collapse and they, they, have, they can't breathe, they get that apnea, they, they wake up, right? Oftentimes they're snoring, they wake up. And that uh, recurrent kind of nightly waking, really, you, get, you don't really get a lot of sleep. You don't get that restful sleep. So a lot of times they complain of daytime sleepiness. Daytime sleepiness. Daytime sleep. It's not only seen in obese patients. Um, one time I saw in a kid with really large tonsils. So I'll write kid with tonsils. All right, so any, basically there's some sort of obstruction. That's the, that's the name of the game. And in obstructive sleep apnea, uh, when you first start, there's nothing wrong with your lungs. You just have uh, an obstruction in your airway. Your lungs are perfectly fine. However, as time goes on, as you're constantly not breathing, then you're gonna start getting that hypoxic vasoconstriction. Your lungs are start, gonna start getting pulmonary hypertension. Your lungs are gonna start getting damaged. All right, so you start getting hypoxia. And when you don't breathe, you retain CO2. You can't breathe out that waste product, so CO2 retention. CO2 retention. How do you diagnose it? You do something called a sleep study. Sleep study. Basically, you sleep, and they observe you and basically measure how much time you wake, if you're having sleep apnea, all this stuff. Fancy word of calling a sleep study is poly Somnography. That's a fancy way of putting it. I'll let you figure out what polysomnography stands for. Uh, I had a question. An overweight truck driver was having daytime sleepiness. You're suspecting sleep apnea. What would be the best test to confirm this? And I looked down at the answer choices and sleep study wasn't there, but this was. All right, so if you don't know this is sleep study, you might get the question wrong, a very easy question wrong. That's obstructive sleep apnea. That's the most common cause, you can also have a central cause. Central meaning it comes from your brain, comes from your respiratory center. Yeah. Look in the history for CNS injury. Something's wrong with your respiratory center and you can't breathe and you get periods of not breathing when you're sleeping. Yeah, so you're sleeping and then your respiratory center shuts down and you just stop breathing. Okay. So make it very clear that you had a CNS injury. Now these are all secondary causes. These are all secondary causes of pulmonary hypertension. All right, you get sleep apnea and then as a result you get pulmonary hypertension. You get a lung pathology and then as a result you get pulmonary hypertension. These are all secondary causes. Are there a, is there a primary cause of pulmonary hypertension? Yeah, and that's called idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Idiopathic. Judging by the name, we don't really know what causes it. Um, however, there are some cases that we do know the cause of. 
This is from mutations in a gene called BMPR2, or bone morphogenetic protein receptor 2. And this gene helps make bone and cartilage, that's where it gets its name. But also in the lungs, it stops smooth muscle proliferation by kind of augmenting the growth factor TGF beta. That's the one that's used in fibrosis and stuff. If you have a mutation in here, then you can't stop smooth muscle fib uh, proliferation. So if you look in the lumen, you'll see a ton of smooth muscle proliferating. That narrows the lumen, narrows the lumen, causes your pulmonary hypertension. All right, because it's a genetic thing, you're gonna see it in a young patient. Because it's a genetic thing, you're gonna see it in a healthy patient. It doesn't really matter if you have lung pathology or not, it's gonna show up regardless. So I suspect this in a young, healthy patient with signs of pulmonary hypertension. So they're getting short of breath, they're getting just exertional dyspnea, yeah. They're seeing all their friends, you know, running in PE and they can't run for some reason. They're just getting so short of breath, so exertional dyspnea. Exertional dyspnea. That is pulmonary hypertension. Let's talk about the drugs. There are some drugs we can use to treat pulmonary hypertension. We said that the radius, the radius of your vasculature is the biggest factor in hypertension. So we're gonna use drugs that kind of mess with this radius. Yeah, there are hormones you release that vasoconstrict your pulmonary vasculature normally, and then there are some hormones that vasodilate. Things that constrict include things like endothelin-1. Things that vasodilate include things like prostacyclin I2 and things like NO. Prostacyclin I2 and NO, all right? We'll look at the first category first. These are things that constrict. We don't want that. So we're gonna to wanna to block this. We're gonna to wanna to give antagonist. And if we can block that, we can stop that constriction. We can dilate it, okay? So that's exactly what we do. We give endothelin one antagonist. Bocentin is the drug name. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I've never seen it used, but Bocentin is the drug name. Now, the question I have, young healthy patient, exertional dyspnea, you do a measurement of the pulmonary artery, it was over 25, so the patient had pulmonary hypertension, and then they gave him Bocentin. What was the mechanism of the drug? It was an endothelin one antagonist stopped vasoconstriction. That's the first class, how about vasodilators? These are things that we do want, we wanna kinda of potentiate this, increase this, right? So we're gonna to wanna to give analogs to this. And that's exactly what we do. We give analogs to our prostacyclin I2. These all end in prost. These all end in prost. Uh, side effects include things like flushing and jaw pain. The flushing, you can vasodilate too much, you get flushing to jaw pain. I wasn't really sure what caused it. I looked it up, didn't really find a cause. But jaw pain is there. And then NO. Nitric oxide causes vasodilation because it activates the enzyme guanylate cyclase and that increases cyclic GMP and cyclic GMP vasodilates. Right. Well eventually you'll, you'll have to stop vasodilating, you can't vasodilate forever and so something called PDE5 will come in and stop degrade cyclic GMP and you stop your vasodilation. Well, in our case, we want to keep that vasodilating going. We want to keep it vasodilating forever, all right? So we don't like this guy. We want to take him out. And if we can take him out, then we can keep our cyclic GMP levels high, keep our vasodilation going. So we're going to get PDE5 inhibitors. PDE5 inhibitors. If that drug sounds familiar to you, it's because it's Viagra. Yeah, that's how Viagra, Cialis, all those um, erectile dysfunction drugs helps erectile dysfunction, cause vasodilation of your penis. Well, here we're gonna cause vasodilation of your lungs. So it's often give as in kind of a, I guess, off-label for pulmonary hypertension, works very, very well. That is pulmonary hypertension, the drugs, the pathophys, the causes. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks.